Thank you so much. It's just amazing to see everybody here. And it's such an honor for me to introduce Dr. Lisa Richardson, who I see at almost every national meeting, but I think it's the first time I've ever seen you in Iowa. So welcome to Iowa. Uh, she is the director of the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, the largest unit within the CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. As director, Dr. Richardson works with partners at the national, state, and local levels to break down barriers to good health and create opportunities for everyone to live a long and healthy life. Under her leadership, the division's four foundational programs, the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, that's the one I always, NCCDBB, for those of us not in that program, um, and let's see, also the National Program of Cancer Registries, near and dear to my heart, uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, and the Colorectal Cancer Control Program, which have helped the cancer control community better understand, prevent, and control cancer in all populations. Dr. Richardson also provides guidance for the division's research agenda that includes the National Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network, or CPCRN, which several of us are part of at the University of Iowa. Dr. Natasha Askelson is the head of that here. And uh, she's also a medical oncologist by training. She has authored or co-authored more than 150 peer-reviewed journal articles examining multi-sectoral approaches to improving cancer care access, delivery, and outcomes. So with no further ado, everybody welcome Dr. Lisa Richardson to Iowa. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me, everybody. This is actually a wonderful, this is my second consortium, and they've all been out sort of in this area. The first one was Nevada, and that was, that was a blast, too, so um, I enjoy getting out and seeing things. But as, as Mary said, it's really, um, as a medical oncologist, um, when I first came to public health in 1997, everybody thought I was completely crazy. Why would you train for that long to be an oncologist then to go not do oncology? But in my opinion, because if you think about what you're doing, it's called cancer control, which is the entire spectrum, right? We limit ourselves to just that part where treatment occurs, but it really is about the whole life, the lifestyle, the lifespan, which we've moved into. And so really, I do enjoy, and also the, the lady that was just speaking about her experience, you know, cancer is a life changing event and that's why I became an oncologist when I tell a person they have cancer they immediately zoom in on you and like what are we going to do about that right and so you know it, it is sad but it's also one of the a common place that people can come together and then get to work and you know cancer control is like that as well sorry I'm going to stand to the side here a little bit so I can see what I'm doing but all the um all the things that you guys are doing here is really we're trying to pattern ourselves after you. We have to do a much better job working together in the government, across the place that I work and lead. So, you know, we have lots of lessons to learn. And I will be in touch with some of you guys because I'm sure I will find a story that needs to be blogged on our website. So, <laughs> you guys do the work. And what I'm most impressed about when I go out in the community is that you don't realize what kind of awesome, you know, world-changing, life-changing work you do because that's what you do every day. Right? Well, this is just my job. Um, but your job, from when I look at it, is really amazing, and the, and the changes that we've made, especially in cancer and cancer control and therapy. I was just telling someone earlier, I'm studying for the boards again. Whew. If you don't see patients every day, it's, it's a tsunami of information, right? Um, but, for, when I, but when I'm out there doing, look, studying, I'm like, my God. When I was a re fellow in 1990, tell your age, 93, I mean, the um, colon cancer was still stage D, and the median survival was six months with 5-FU, right? Now, if groups like, I don't know if you work with them here in Iowa, but groups like Fight Colorectal Cancer, almost all of those people you see and they come out and talk to you, they're stage four cancer survivors. I mean, six months, five to six years, you know, God only knows how far we'll be able to go. Um, and so I'm just, so I can see all sides of it. Somebody was like, why are you here at CDC? I said, well, it's called control, right? That means don't get it. When you get it, treat it well. And then if you survive it, when you survive, and even if you don't, let's have a good life and a good quality of life as we move through the thing. So that's my soapbox. I'll get off of it now. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, the real reason, you know, at CDC, there's going to be 22 million survivors here fairly soon. That's a lot of people. But when you think about it, you know, my challenge to the people that work where I work, I ask a lot of questions, too. It's just my nature. So does 22 million people make a public health problem? No, public health is not about numbers. It's about impact, right? You can have a huge impact on 22 million people, that, but that doesn't make it a public health problem. So what makes, you know, what makes what we do sort of fit in our wheelhouse as public health? And so this is a, a graphic that I found that looks at public health systems. So how do systems, you know, work? You know, if you have a lot of arrows, and, um, and I'll show you a little bit of real data. We're, I'm also a data-driven, love data kind of person. So I will, um, what is that thing called, trust and verify? <laughs> you tell me something, I'll trust you, but I will go back and verify what you said or try to figure out what that means or come back to you directly and ask you, well, what did you mean by that? And so, but strong public health systems um, save lives, and so I'll show you some of that. So in the, um, the last revision of the um, Essentials of Public Health, equity was added to the middle of the circle. Used to be research. And this was before the pandemic. They started redoing this report in 2019. Um, I thought I turned it on. Too much coffee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he said green was, oh, never mind. Green is good. I should have just left it alone. Okay, never mind. Um, but anyway, so even before the pandemic that, you know, exposed a lot of issues that many of us in the room already knew existed, now everybody knows they exist. But really in public health, we were, we were moving towards the equity in the middle of all the work we do, even before the pandemic occurred. So, you know, I think the evolution of thinking in public health is really, because that's what we do, right? We do, we serve people who wouldn't otherwise get served. And, you know, do things that other people wouldn't otherwise, you know, know. Somebody laughed, I'll, I'll check with you later. <laughs> it's like, what's funny? So this is one of the, um, this slide actually depicts my um, confliction as a medical oncologist. Um, some of the stuff we're gonna talk about in the afternoon about precision medicine, and then um, the, the, the community, the environment, you know, where we all live versus, you know, the super duper duper, um, so this is the upside down pyramid. When I think about it, it's sort of SNPs are at the top, you know, the little, you know, single nucleotide polymorphism kind of thing we like to look for. Um, and then at the bottom, it's really the whole person where you live in your community, right? And so this is really what we look at as the health impact pyramid at CDC. But when I think about it in medical terms, it also applies as well, but it's usually the opposite way. So, does, do public health, comprehensive public health systems save lives and save money? Absolutely. So this was a study um, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and if you look at the comprehensive centers on the, um, the left, you'll see that the expenditures per capita are smaller um, and more of the recommended activities excuse me, lower, or more of the recommended activities are performed in those communities. So it sounds like from some of the discussions I've had and talking to people, there are quite a few communities who will like that one there on the, the left, um, the comprehensive. And then if you look even closer, because we want data, you know, what are the economic impacts of the, um, the economic effects? And then what are the do we save lives effects, right? And so um, we do, larger gains in low resource communities. If we go into those communities, we can make a difference. One of the things I think that disturbs me, well, uh, not disturbs me, but makes me sad sometimes is that when people aren't doing well, we tend to penalize them. We should like double down and go into those places and make sure they get exactly what they need. Because people who are really doing well, they're gonna do well regardless of whether we come in there or not. Right? And so if you think about how human nature is, because that's how human, oh, you're messing up. We're going to have to take your mess away. Well, then they're just going to get worse, right? And things are not going to get better. And, you know, and then we'll be back here again next year talking about how the death rate went up in X community, right, that year, instead of getting in there. And so, but that is sort of a shift change in how we do business. And then the most important thing to me is this graphic, is that if you have comprehensive systems of health in public health, and this is a public health study, it does improve mortality from all, you know, all types of um, different types of conditions. All-cause mortality, cardiovascular, diabetes, and cancer 
all of the death rates in those comprehensive communities are lower than they are in communities that don't have comprehensive public health systems. So what is that? So the uh, Robert Wood Johnson has a program called, um, okay, I'm gonna have to let y'all know what that is later. It, but it's a program where they go out and they reward communities that have good outcomes, and every one of these communities has a comprehensive system of public health where they have better outcomes. The schools, all the businesses work together. Everybody's working together for health, not disease treatment. There's a big difference. We call ourselves public health, but we're still out there doing mostly the same thing everybody else is doing, treating disease. And really what we want to do is prevent the disease in the first place, and then we don't have to treat it. That's why I'm in public health, by the way, as an oncologist. I know the end point of what cancer is, but I also know there are things you can do to prevent it. And by the way, it is hard. I'm not making, I'm, people say, all you have to do is eat right. Really? <laughs> Exercise, really? I'm like, really? Anyway, whatever. You, you still take some amount of you know, mind change and internal mind change to make that happen. So you know, in, my, um, in my job at CDC, you know, we collect a truckload of data, right? And one of the things we weren't doing was like putting it out there for consumption immediately in a form that people could understand. So about a couple of years ago, like the 2021 data will be posted on our website probably in January or February, just finalized 2021. That's the best we can do at the moment. But that's pretty good. It's better than this being, you know, in our health system, in our um, USCS data system is 2019. So as soon as the data are available, we collect your tax dollars, collected all that information. So why aren't we sharing it with you? And so this is something that we started a couple of years ago, where as soon as these data are available and we're working on it, and this year we're going to put a COVID spin on it, like what were the changes in death among people with cancer, you know, related to COVID? And, the, you know, the short answer is everybody did worse. And as you would have expected, immunocompromised people with lymphoma and leukemia did really worse. And so just to, to sort of highlight again, immunocompromised people are a special subset of people that we need to pay attention to. And we've got a ton of criticism from CDC that we don't do enough of that. And I happen to agree with that. Why wouldn't I? I'm an oncologist, right? <laughs> anyway, so this is cancer deaths. And uh, we put Iowa side by side. You guys have, you know, it looks like it's slightly higher, but the death rates are, you know, a um, little bit, but everything's going down. They're, you know, and just showing this as a way to sort of show how you look compared to others is that, you know, there are multiple, multiple, multiple reasons this could happen, right? And so what data are to me is a way to go look and say, I wonder why that happened. And then when you look at, um, if you go to our data system that's down there, the data visualization tool, you can even look at it by county, your uh, death rate by county, incidence by county, all the top cancers. And, you know, if you're feeling it, you can look at it by, um, Congressional district, you know, I did that on purpose. We did that on purpose. So to provide tools to everybody to go out and I can't do it myself, but you guys are more than free to go talk to anybody you want to talk to. So um, we put it again, but that's really what we do in public. That's what we should be doing is providing tools for you guys to go out there and be empowered to um, make differences in your community. You guys all know this, you know, the disparities um, persist no matter what. And that I would even say they've gotten deeper um, there are multiple systems and sectors of healthcare, and this is what I meant by, you know, Iowa may look different on some things, you look a lot better on some cancers, maybe not as good on other cancers, but there's, like I said, there's so many things that impact. It really is a community level effort. You got to get in there, in the community, what's going on, and make, and that's where the difference is. And once you, you feel kind of like, um, I think with health equity and all the stuff that's going on, we all feel a little um, discouraged. So there's this thing I read called the three foot rule. Like you control the things that are three feet around you and then not the things that are, you know, a thousand miles in Washington, DC. And I really do think, but once you control the three feet around you, all those things will bubble up and they will come to the point where, um, I'm a cup half full kind of girl too, if you hadn't noticed, but um, it'll all work out, you know, if we all work together. And then why do they matter? I mean, really everybody should really have the same opportunity with their health. Correct. Again, not disease. Now, once you have disease, there's a certain imperative for us to go and make sure everybody gets the same treatment, the same, you know, access to care. Love that hotel program because that, that woman may not have been able to come 
to Des Moines to get treatment because it was so far away. The weather is so bad here in the winter. You know, all those kinds of things. And really, when we're thinking about treatment, it's not just getting there to get your, you know, dose of radiation that day. It's a thousand other things that are happening in your life that, have, that we have to be sensitive to. The pandemic really has um, impacted the public health and what we do. You know, the quote here is probably the most important thing. It, this was a quote from a person that was in this study. You know, HPV probably is not at the top of our list, um, which is, you know, you may have noticed that in your own data that things have not you know, kind of fallen off. Um, but this was a, an example of, you know, how do we get people into care? How do we make sure people get back into care, which is really where we are now, um, without being terrified? Who knew? There you go. <laughs> I probably should have known though, right? <laughs> I should have known, I'm sorry. But um, anyway, but this is a, a perfect example of going out into the community and like, what is bothering people, right? This past weekend, I did a um, project. Some of you may know Glory Coronado. She um, is at, in uh, Portland. But she came up with this technique called boot camp translation. You can do this anywhere, by the way. S you can do it in treatment. You can do it all along the spectrum or any your blood pressure control, anywhere. But we develop messages thinking that we're speaking to people and we're just, you know, whoosh, 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 right? So we took the, for this particular project, it was colorectal cancer uh, screening in African American with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So we decided to go right in there where, you know, where the people are that can tell us. And we took the ACS messages that they just developed in their toolkit that they downloaded. And we asked them, you know, we asked the people there, does this make any sense to you? Does this word mean anything? How can we change these messages to resonate with you as a person that we want to encourage to get screened for colon cancer? But you can really do this with anything. We're going to do a project this year coming up. We had some extra money left over where we're going to do this with Native American communities. All of these messages we have out there for people, are they working? Are we just spinning our wheels and basically resources, money, energy, and all that good stuff? When I say resources, I don't just mean money. I mean people resources, you know, time, energy, all that stuff. And do they work? And I think this is a perfect example. So how can we get HPV back on the top of the list, right? So one time, it's well, almost going to be a one-time thing. If that NCI study works out, it may end up being one shot, which would, oh, my God, my son got it when it was three shots. It was hard. <laughs> Even though I knew what the benefits were, I still had to show up three times to get a vaccine. It was tough, yeah. But um, anyway, and this is during the pandemic. Is this, this, this is a different study, but just sort of looking at how things sort of you know, down in this particular place that we went, it did go up a bit. Um, after the initial wave of the pandemic, people kind of lost interest in sort of sharing with us like what the current state is. So this is the most current thing I could find um, through a year old now looking at how many screenings were missed. But we predict, well, the people who are doing the predictions out there, it's like tens of millions of people are behind. And the real challenge here is how are we going to use our current healthcare system when in some places can barely keep up to make up all that backlog, right? And there are some thoughts out there about how to do that. So I'll kind of speed through. This is, a, again, the pandemic effect. You see when everything closed, came back up. Everything's coming back up at different rates. What cancer diagnoses were made, not made. Um, later on, will the stage be higher? Um, there are people already seeing some of that, I believe. And then we say, well, just go and talk to your doctor. <laughs> what does that mean, even mean, right? So here we see these on the left is primary care shortage areas. You see on the right that they've gotten more and more of those. So the people that we're asking to take care of, um, the primary care providers were asking to take care of people and get them you know, in, into the system, there's fewer and fewer of them. And I think that will continue. Um, even at CDC, we're having challenges with people who've been there 25 years, you know, 26 years. They're retiring. So I have three people retiring at the end of this year who are in, on my leadership team, which means, you know, that's, that's going to be a void that we have to fill. And this is everywhere. People are just, I don't know what you guys think, but people are worn out from this whole thing. And, you know, with it getting harder and harder and harder to take care of patients, I think, you know, that's my opinion. Um, those, those people who are closer to, to getting out are getting out because it, it, it is a struggle. 
So switching really quickly to um, what we do at CDC. Um, is anybody watching the time? Let me know, okay? Okay, you are, okay, sorry. I was just like, is anybody, I didn't ask you to watch the time, let me know. Um, but quickly, I was a co-lead of our health equity task force within our center. Our center does diabetes, um, heart disease, stroke prevention, um, obesity, smoking and health. So it's really the chronic diseases and chronic disease risk factors. So they asked me to, um, I don't usually volunteer for this kind of stuff because it takes, it's just, anyway, we, we talk about that offline. Because it really is, we, we try and try and try, you know, what is the sincerity of the system to really change, right? So you have to question yourself, is it worth it, Lisa? So then at this point, I was like, you know what? I think with the pandemic, this was like right after, this was like the, the year the pandemic started. So in the summer of 2020, I said, okay, it might be worth a shot. And I got a little energy for that. But these are the groups, the, the subgroups that we had. And really it was, how do, we, um, how do we change the system? I'm more of a systems change kind of person. So what we had done previously, <laughs> this group I led, and this might be why I was less than enthusiastic, is that we did this long you know, study, a strategy thing. We gave it to the director, director at the time, and they threw it in the trash. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Fully expected. See, I don't really have very high expectations sometimes, so when I hit the mark, I go, wow, that was great. So I, n totally, because it wasn't there. I don't understand that. It wasn't my thing either, right? I didn't do that. Well, it was good. You know, it was, well, anyway, I thought it was. So let me tell you real quick, like, let's go to the notice of funding opportunity. Those of you in the room who apply for, you know, funding from CDC in our center, and I think we're the only one that does this, we now have a checklist for health equity that every single notice of funding opportunity has to have it in there. And the trick on this one was it's an opt-out option. You have to tell us why you're not going to talk about that in your notice of funding opportunity. You see the difference, right? Because if it was opt-in, we might get 5% participation. Now we're going to get 95% participation because you have to tell, it might be 100% when we go back and look at the numbers this year. This is the first year we've done it. But you really do have to, you have to build accountability into the things that you're doing. You just have to build it in, right? Otherwise, you know, people go, I don't want to do that. Um, the one we've had the biggest struggles with is research and data because there's so much of it out there. Um, the other thing, too, that, we've no that I noticed is that people feel like they have to go and create their own when there's so much out there. And so that one has been the biggest struggle. But even that one, we're continuing and trying to figure out how to. I don't know if Iowa did this, but we offered um, on the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System Survey, we offered um, Reactions to Race, which is Kamara Jones's module. You guys probably know Kamara Jones. And um, a Special Social Determinants of Health module for BRFSS, and I, I would think Iowa would have picked that up, but you know, I don't have the, I should know that too, right? Um, we can look on the web and get that. But yeah, so we are trying to, what can we do as CDC to provide things for people to do, do the things that they do? Um, I'm probably, if I get behind, just tell me, I can speed it up. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So this is our strategic plan on one slide. There is no backup document to this because you won't read it anyway. So why, why would you do that, right? Yeah, I love being in charge of this place, y'all, because I get to do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> but seriously, people do not read strategic plans. It's like, ah, oh, what's wonderful, we're gonna sit in a room for, this took three months because we've done, I've been in our division, shouldn't tell them, 1997. We've done, we did at least three or four of these over from 1997 till the time I took over uh, eight years ago. So what I did, the shortcut was, we took all that information we never did anything with <laughs> and gave it to the contractor. And because nothing had really changed, right, as far as I could tell, they did some, you know, some new interviews, but it was a very short. So in three months, they came up with this, and this is the entire thing. And we've already, to the point that somebody made about the cancer plan being a living document, we have already updated this once three years ago. And the plan is to update this again this year. It was very, very small changes. We, the biggest thing we did was simplify the language, reduce risk of cancer. It doesn't get any simpler than that, right? So then you choose that thing you want to do. And then what I heard today, the one in the middle, scale best practices to increase screening outcomes. And the, you know, the aspiration is all people get the right screening at the right time for the best outcome. It used to say the right care. But since we do screening, we sort of tried to 
bring that in. But that's really, if you can't get to the place that's giving you the treatment, you're not going to get the treatment and you don't get the outcome that you need, right? And so this is my very, I'm a, I'm a lump or two, not a splitter. So this is why this is like, it's lumped. But, and then you can see yourself in all of this, um, which is the other thing. I don't see myself. I'm like, how can you not see yourself in that? I mean, it's everything, right? We don't do treatment, but we collect data in which you can look at treatment from cancer registries. We do special studies in you know, cancer treatment where you can look at those types of things. So as long as it relates. And then the bailiwick, my, um, my biggest one at the moment, and you guys do a great job here in Iowa, is the cancer survivor one. That one seems to be a conundrum to people. You know, what do you do in cancer survivors? Well, Cancer survivors, just by having a cancer, have the highest risk of getting another cancer. Why aren't we out there with, on steroids doing primary prevention? Ten? Okay. All right. In cancer survivors, that really, and quality of life, you know, we like to think about quantity of life. But as I, you know, as I talk to patients, it's been about, you know, three years since when the pandemic happened. I stopped going to the VA. I used to go to the VA in Atlanta. Um, but they really do want to live a good life. It's not just about the number of days. It's about what is the quality of life that I'm going to live. And that really is what we're trying to concentrate on there. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, you all know about our division. I see a lot of our grantees in the room. They thank you for everything that you do. Uh, this is the cancer control continuum that was really um, put out there by the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Abrams, a long time ago. But this is really how I think about cancer. Um, when we were thinking about planning, the last big giant planning thing that we did, everybody wanted to stick to, I was the minority report in the room, I expressed my disagreement with the way it was going, but everybody wanted to cite specific, like lung cancer, breast cancer, and that's fine, but when there's a new, let's say there's a new innovation like lung cancer screening with CT scan. How do you deal with that if you're trying to be an organization that's trying to do things in an organized way? Well, you deal with it by doing early detection, right? So early detection is in the control continuum. Every time there's a new thing in early detection, insert, and then we can go on and start doing the work that way, right? And so, but everybody, because we're funded, and that's another thing is that we get stuck on how we're funded. At, unlike other agencies, and unlike the NCI, we are funded by lines, so we have a breast cancer line, a lung cancer line, and it does sort of, and we hear from you all all the time, why can't we just blend it all? Well, Congress has the ability or the authority to come down and audit us on every single line that we have and see if we spent it on the thing that they gave it to us for. So that's why. But cancer survivors, there's all lines, you know, all the things that I'm most excited about you can do it in any line because there's survivors everywhere, right? And so it's really one of those things where you be a little bit more creative. So I think I'm going to have to end this early. But you guys can have the slides um, later. So this was right before um, we were, um, as you all know, we were told in the federal government that we couldn't talk about race for a while. It was about a year and a half, actually. It wasn't trivial. But we got this one through the system right before that. So this is, a, this is something I've been wanting to do forever, but how do we work with communities and community organizations to address disparities? The one, I'll, the one uh, primary prevention is a community group in Jackson, Mississippi called Blacks Against Tobacco that's working with a contractor, but they applied for this money to look at smoking in Jackson, Mississippi among black people who tend to have more impact from smoking, right? Smoke fewer cigarettes, get cancer more frequently. Um, different types of tobacco, menthol tobacco, but this is really one of those efforts is how can, because I don't really, in my opinion, reading everything, there's not a lot of evidence out there about how to do this health disparities thing in the community. So these three groups are going to be building that evidence base, which is what you guys do. And when you write about it, everybody can learn about it, right? Um, which is why we encourage people to write about what they're doing. Um, because it, in, in my world, sometimes it doesn't exist if you don't write about it and talk about it. The National Conference of Cancer Control, thank you very much. Cancer Plan, yes. <laughs> Again, partnerships, couldn't do it without it. This is our cancer control partnership um, that um, is mostly unfunded. I think 90% of them show up because they're wanting to help us get the job done. Um, and this has been one of the things that we've been able to sort of um, maximize and use to move the agenda at CDC. 
if I had my computer, I could skip through this. So just some of the things we do in primary prevention, um, the, the HPV roundtable. Now there's roundtables and everything. There was an announcement yesterday you saw that the, the uh, cancer de president's cancer panel recommended more, you know, roundtable activity might be something we would do. So yesterday I think the first lady launched the breast, not, yeah, breast line roundtable and the um, cervical cancer screening roundtable. So we'll see how that goes. There's always a building phase. This is one of my favorite projects we fund with the um, Office of Smoking and Health. There are lots of groups who smoke more, people with behavioral issues, LGBTQ, those types of groups. So this network, and they're, they're up for funding again this year, the network is, um, we work with them to sort of figure out how to, um, how to work with those high-risk populations to get you know, smoking to a lower level. Um, and that's actually one of our, I think, one of our biggest um, successes. And this year we hope to expand it um, to include some more disability type groups, in disability, visual, excuse me, visible and invisible. Learning all the new language. We'll just skip through that. This is where our data goes. Um, we work with the National Center for Environmental Health. You can go to their website. The um, link is down there, the melanoma dashboard. And you can look at melanoma in your community based on UV, all of those things. It's a problem in Iowa. It might not be the sun, but it's the snow and all the other things. We forget that the UV comes in many, many, many forms. But you can actually track you know, melanoma based on the risk factors, you know, like UV exposure and those types of things. It's really a nice. We try to put all this stuff out to you guys in emails, but you know, sometimes we kind of miss the mark. So. And I'm going to end here. Do I have like two minutes? OK. All right. Um, so I'll go until I run out of time then. Um, the National Program of Cancer Registries, there's 50 central cancer registries that we fund. Um, when we put our data together with the um, National Cancer Institute, SEER program, which is in Iowa, we have a 100% coverage of the US. So since 1997, I think it's 97 or 90, 96, if you go at these data, this is the actual um, picture of what it looks like. I think it's really easy to use. Um, that it has um, a census of cancer cases since 1997. Um, so 20, 25 plus million. You can look at all kinds of different, if you're doing some exploratory work, you can look at all kinds of different things um, in the data. And we have a release coming up in that was June of 2022 was when we added um, state level data on survival, prevalence, and stage of diagnosis. So just briefly, this, the prevalence data out there are, are um, estimates from SEER. So if you go into our database right now, you can see 18 year prevalence of cancer survivors in Iowa based on the data that you guys have provided. And we got quite a bit of that from um, NCI as well, but and every state can look at now how many people in their state have survived cancer, not an estimate, and not self-report. So we've done the self-report thing as well, and it's um, sketchy, to say the least, right? Um, and this is our surveillance vision. Um, sounds like you guys have, um, I think uh, Kelly said you guys applied for some of the DMI money. Jill, sorry. D data modernization at CDC, um, we've been about 15 years ahead of the agency on the work that we do with data collection. Um, trying to get some attention though from people now that COVID is a thing has been, is almost impossible. Like you know, you could use a lot of those methods we've used to sort of get cancer data. Um, but we're making slow and steady progress there. Um, trying to get the attention, the resources, and um, Jill said that the, the registries or the health, the state health department was, you know, brought different groups in and she was able to represent cancer control and that, that's great. So I think I'm going to end this here. Um, this is actually one of, another one of my philosophical things um, and I can just end it there with that. Um, Screening is more than a test. What we, what we, so a lot of the stuff we read now is, oh God, our screening rate is 80%. They got a fit test, right? Well, did they get a follow-up when it was abnormal? And if they had cancer, did they get treatment? That's the continuum. It's not just a test. And um, so the lang some of the, a lot of the language that we're using in communications at CDC is really moving away from that. ACS, you know, Dr. Dr. Rich Winder, when he was there, we, he and I used to talk about this all the time. Um, but it really, and everybody in the room knows, it really is more than a test. It's a process. And if you don't, 
what we learned in breast cancer way back in the day with breast cancer screening, and this is probably true for all cancer screening, is that if you don't tell people what's coming next, they might not show up for the next thing. And so you've created, in my mind, that the, the real tragedy there is you've created a lot of anxiety in people with a positive test that they have no intention of following up on because they're scared, right? And so, but your opportunity to educate, I think the best opportunity is when you recommend the test and, you know, have a sit down. And we're actually working on a couple things. There's, um, there's a uh, simulated human on our website named um, Nathan Bennett. And he, t <laughs> they're like real people once you sit down and do it, right? But Nathan Bennett is a man that's trying to decide whether he should get screened for prostate cancer. And you can click the choices and he talks to you and you can go back and look at it and ask all the questions you want for as long as you can go back to that thing and stay with it all day till you understand. And the goal for that, and then there's a second one is how do you, if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, what do you need to know when you go to the doctor so you can ask the right questions and make sure you're getting the right thing? You know, it's, it's a tragedy that we have to depend, put that burden on people to make sure that that happens. But, you know, in the system we have here in the U.S., that tends to be sometimes how it happens, right? Navigation is really um, one of those other things that helps that. Um, you all have been doing navigation forever, by the way. It just has a fancy name now. It's called social work. It's called case management. It's called all of those things that you've always done. Now they've just put a fancy name on it. So um, I don't really care about names. It's what are we trying to accomplish? And then let's go accomplish that. And if somebody hooks a name on it, you know, get your money for it, you know, stick that name on it and get that cash, right? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. But remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's a process, right? It's the thing you're doing. So I'll stop there. I got tons more. I really did try to cut it back this morning, y'all, but anyway, I got so much stuff I like to tell you. But I'll be here all day if you guys want to, if anybody here wants to come and talk to me. And I think we're going to have questions now. And there's only about maybe two questions I can't answer, so I'm happy to answer. There's a couple I just won't do. So, anyway. Thank you so much. Oh. Sorry about that, y'all. I'll do, I'll do a better job next time. Invite me back next year. <laughs> How about you could take this one out, maybe? It works. He can turn it on. Is this on? Oh, he got you. It's not on. Here, you want to use this one? I'll just, I'll just project. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Richardson. Are there any questions? This is none of these are on. I don't think. We're besties. I'll yeah. just get closer. <laughs> we had dinner together, so. <laughs> um, yes, Dr. Weiner. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think about these things a lot, so <laughs> thanks for the question. I think what, what I really, and we're still not doing it, by the way, which is very you know, horrible to me, and you guys are probably going to do it. It's about planning, right? And it's about having a plan in place, you know, in cancer control. For instance, you know, we notice that people don't come for their radiation therapy. Why don't we get them a place to stay? I mean, the VA's been doing that forever with the Hope Lodge right, uh, when I was training. So I really do think it's planning. I think it's anticipating what might be coming down the pike, which is hard to do. Um, for this one, it could have been who would have ever guessed anything this horrible would happen, right? But, you know, in, um, I guess the military, if we could go learn some lessons from the military. This is what they do. They plan for the worst possible thing that could happen. And then when it, you know, then when something does happen, you sort of pick your parts out. And part of the thing I think that's going to happen with CDC, I don't know if this is getting at your, <laughs> at your question, but what's, what we're kind of lobbying, well, we're not lobbying, but the people who lobby for us is why can't we have a permanent emergency operations center that's on the ready to go when these things happen? 
For us, this is, you know, you may not know this, but, you know, this is one of the things, the hidden challenges that we have is we don't have any money for emergency response until there's an emergency. And then you're already behind the eight ball. Um, so, you know, so you're already like, we're out in the field doing stuff with what we have, which is not a lot. Um, well, how that plays out in real life, I have been deployed to the emergency response Coming up on my fifth time here in December, I know nothing about that stuff. My God. I mean, I mean it's, it's interesting and it's all of that, but, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a crew of people that this is what they do for a living, right? This is what they think about all the time. And so I think at least half of our staff have been deployed at some point over the last two and a half years. Similar to, the, and thank everybody here in the room in our programs, because we I can't remember what it was called, Expanded Authority? Um, where the state could just take all of our government, our federally you know, funded project people, and just put them out in the field to do COVID, which happened a lot. Um, it has slowed, <laughs> seems to have slowed down quite a bit. Um, I don't know what came through for monkeypox. I don't remember anything coming across my desk, but we were specifically told by the response that your people in Iowa will be working on COVID, not your stuff. And so we lost ground there as well with the cancer control stuff. And there it's really, there's a couple studies out there that I didn't talk about where they've actually modeled what would it take to catch up. And I can share those with you later if you'd like to see them. Was that okay? But I think it, is, I think it really is about anticipating what's coming. Again, there's another, if you follow the news, Ebola's on the move again in Africa. So we're gonna be expected to pull up and you know go to, go to Africa. And some of us are already there and have been there for a while. So. It's a, and in this environment we're in now, it's a constant struggle and we should really be continuously planning. And you know, you guys as well. I think this is on now, thank you. Other questions people have? Yes. I especially like, I especially liked your instrumental variables. Uh, it's good to see that on the slide. Yeah. Uh, Regarding research at the CDC, what would you like some of us um, in the research field using some of the data that you mentioned? What are some of the pressing unanswered questions or methods that you'd like to see in the next five, 10 years? Thank you. So as far as, so in the past, so I think um, what I would ask is that people broaden their um, definition of what research is. That's one of my pet peeves. So I've done epidemiology research, health services research, clinical trials. I even worked in a lab for two years and killed on bacteria looking for something I never did find. I was like, I gotta go find something else to do with my life. So <laughs> that was actually that event, but really it's sort of, um, I think people talk like practice, I don't know what kind of research you do, but how can you go in and evaluate what's going on in a community to build evidence for the thing there may not have been a study out there on it. I think that type of practice-based evidence, practice-based evaluation is critical. And that, and just some of the research I didn't, some of the stuff I didn't get to show you was one of our um, you know, most comprehensive evaluations we've done on the colon cancer control program, which you guys have here in the state, is that you know, what are the levers of movement and then how do you move those levers in the place that you are? But if you do research in public health, it's really what, do, what does research mean, right? It's, it's really just a question, right? It's a strong question, hypothesis, no, you know, all of that. So I've done all those types of research, and it, there really are common things. And um, just to, to realize what we do is just as important. Now, data-wise, what we're trying to do is get the data used more for whatever reason you want it, to just get it out there to be known that we do have the United States cancer statistics. You know, we do track and follow that. We have noticed that the... Um, the um, number of citations in the literature have gone up significantly in the, five, in the last five or six years, but that's because we're pushing it really hard. And, it, and if you want to talk about what you could do, that's fine. For instance, I had a graduate student, don't ask me why she wanted to write this paper, I don't know. <laughs> she was in the surveillance branch, but we looked at intraspinal tumors. Because we have so many cases, you can get a sample size large enough from 1997 until 2019, we'll be putting 2020 data up, you know, this coming up spring, but you can pretty much look at any problem and try to figure out where it's so rare that you don't have enough cases that you could like do, you know, some simple stuff, not really, you know, a bunch of complicated things, but there's so much we don't know, right? And we do collect every single case of cancer in the country. 
Um, one of our quality metrics is um, before death diagnosis. I think it's 0.1% of people are diagnosed at death, which is a quality metric in the program. And if it's higher, we, we go in and try to help people figure out why they're not, people aren't being diagnosed before they die. So yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of mess under there, but love to talk to you later if you've got some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Other questions people have? Yes. with cancer and then follow all the way through the whole process then so then after you've had the cancer it says that you can get it again yes most of the doctors stop they don't I tell know. you that I know, I know that it could possibly come to, again so then how much how much study is it to for that and then what's the possibility so then after your five years and then you are you are a diagnosed what, what do you call it you're in remission Right. Okay, so you're in remission. Possibility you could get it again. So then they have studies like, so if you have breast cancer, how, right. what percentage would that be of getting it again or, or that or some other type of cancer? And then what can you do to prevent that from happening? What happened in the first place? Too much sugar? Something, you know, like what? what yes, ma'am. There you milk. go. You answered your own question. Yeah, Everything that like, caused cancer that? in the first place can cause you to get another one. And in particular, let's say the one that, you know, strikes me the, the most is smoking. You, you get a tremendous benefit if you're diagnosed with cancer and you stop smoking. If you continue, it's 1% to 2% per year that you're going to get another smoking-related cancer if you don't quit. Right. There's still a high risk that cancer is the one where the risk doesn't fall off quite as fast as we would like it to. Um, and so if you look at some of the, the trying, and you're right, the question is how many people who already have, have had a cancer get a cancer? And I think, I'll have to look this number up for sure, but I think it's, it's over 15% of new cancers are occurring people that have already had a cancer. Right. And so it's all about one of the things we've noticed too when we look at it, women with breast cancer do really, 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 really good for like two or three years and then they fall back down just like the rest of the population. I mean, you're at high risk for getting another breast cancer if you've had one, right? Mm -hmm. And then women, so I think it's, I, quite frankly, I just think it's healthcare entry access fatigue myself. I mean, you just get tired of it, right? And if you talk to people like some of the qualitative work out there, some people don't even want to talk about the fact that they've had cancer. And that was one of the things I said, you know, about having data on who actually, data-wise, we know you had cancer from the cancer registry, that when you ask people, a lot of people either don't want to tell you <laughs> that, that they had cancer or they truly don't remember what it was that happened because of what you just said. Was it explained that way? Were the things... And if you don't know it was cancer, you don't remember it was cancer, you may not think you need to do anything. So there's a whole bunch of psychological things that we're working on. That's what I'm interested in, actually. Maybe my next life after I leave CDC. Mm -hmm. I'm getting old, but I'm not that old. But <laughs> OK? OK. Um, I think we have time for one more question. We had 15 minutes, and it's 9.12. If there's any other questions people have. Liz Kelly has a question. <laughs> and by the way, it's really good to see everybody. I think I've, I've recognized about 50% of the faces in here. I didn't know you all. You guys were from Iowa. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> yes. Dr. Richardson, thank, thank you so much. Is this on? Yeah, we okay. it's on. Yeah. Um, I was going to wait and ask you this later because I think there will be a narrow interest in this. But I loved your, your um, online strategic plan that is one page. I love that. So smart, so clear. My question is, how do you associate measures with that? So the, the, the measures part is really the work. So what we, so how I, okay, when I leave, it'll probably all go you know where, but, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, yeah, saying. But when, when, we, when we assess work as a division, does that work line up? And it can line up with any of it. It can line up with the four guiding principles, the places we said we could lead, um, the three priorities. I mean, you could almost drive a truck through this thing, right? Um, people don't get that part, though, and I try to tell them all the time. You know you can drive a truck through this thing, right? And they say, I don't see myself. I'm like, well, what are you looking for, right? Or what are you looking at in the mirror? I don't know. But, um, it's one, but that's how we do it. Does it line up with those three priorities, the places we said we could lead? Um, for instance, in our notice of funding opportunity, you notice the research one. There's one in each priority area. Then within that, 
And it really is about finding those measures that already, because we're always trying to find new stuff too, but we're really not, you know, new, you know, new stuff. For instance, this is something that the people in our program, um, the Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, found and inserted in the NOFO for 2202, our current version, is something called SMARTY goals. So it's SMART goals with equity, with an equity lens. So everything, they, everything that you all report to us has to tell us what the equity component is of that measure. Right? So it could be whatever you want. And by the way, it could be whatever you want it to be as long as you explain what the equity component is of that. Right? But every single goal in that particular program and that project is 260 million or 280 million, the entire thing. So that's our big, that's our big, but that's where we're going to get. And once we start getting, you got, when you start reporting that to us, we'll be able to roll it up and um, have a look at what we're doing nationally in the, the comprehensive cancer control world and the BNC world and so forth and so on. And it's all about how you talk about it too, okay. right? Thank you. Happy to talk to you later about that. You might give me some new ideas. <laughs> all right, thanks All right, everybody. thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Richardson. Thank you.